This morning, I want you to open your Bibles again to the first chapter of the book of Philippians. And what a beautiful Lord's Day this is. And I want us, before we read our passage, to bow our heads and just to thank God for the day that he's given us and to ask that the Holy Spirit will have free and unhindered course this morning in every heart to apply the Word of God to our hearts. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful today for this is the day that you have made. And we're thankful that you've made the day for us and you have made us for the day. We're thankful also that you declare in your word that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so, Father, we pray that you would enable us by your divine spirit to simply walk in the way in which you have prepared for us this day. We thank thee for this beautiful day in which we can come together and worship and study and meditate upon the things that thou hast done for us. And I pray now in Jesus' name that as we open the book and as we read and speak of these things, that the same Holy Spirit who inspired these words will illuminate our hearts and minds so that we may comprehend them and more than just comprehend them, but, Father, that they may be life to us, that we may take them as bread and water, as nourishment. And so we commit this service to thee And pray in his name that all may be done to his glory. Amen. Now, in first chapter of Philippians, we're going to begin reading this morning with the ninth verse and read through verse 11. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Yesterday morning, you'll remember, we dealt with the first eight, chapter, uh, eight verses of this book, and we talked about things worth being thankful for. And it seems to me that perhaps above everything else, the book of Philippians is a book of right values. Paul, as we've already indicated, is in a Roman prison. And not to imply that he has not previously known this, but I think in a very fresh way. He is realizing what are the true values of life, the things that matter most. And this morning, I want us to think about something worth praying for. Yesterday, things worth being thankful for. This morning, something worth praying for. And uh, next time, tomorrow, we will speak on this subject of things worth suffering for. But this morning, something worth praying for. And we'll pick it up in verse 9 and read through verse 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. I was thinking just last night as I was going over this passage how often and how easily it is that I'll say to somebody, well, friend, I've been praying for you, or I'm going to pray for you. And the thought came to me, what would I say if the person countered with this? Oh, Well, exactly what have you been asking God to do for me? And, you know, it might be a little embarrassing. And uh, as we dismiss our services and we talk and visit with people, we'll occasionally say sometimes without even thinking, well, uh, I'll be praying for you, or we'll ask somebody to pray for us. But what what if I were to come to you this morning and say, listen, you say you've been praying for me. Exactly what have you been praying Give me the specifics of the petition. Well, now, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing. If you'll look back over in verse uh, 3 and 4, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, 
making requests with joy. He has said, I pray for you always in every prayer of mine, I'm praying for you. And now, beginning in verse 9, he gives us the details of that prayer. He lists the specifics of that petition. And it's really interesting and profitable to see what it is he prays for. What would you suppose the apostle would ask God to do in the lives of these believers? I want to remind you that when Paul prays and it is recorded in the Word of God, that immediately means that he is expressing not simply a personal desire, but he is expressing the divine intention. He is writing and praying under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. And so what makes these prayers profitable for us is that in, when Paul expresses his desire for these Philippians, he is in effect expressing God's desire for us. Now, what would you ask God for? I mentioned yesterday when we were talking about this matter of thanksgiving that probably in nowhere else do we betray our uh, ties to material and physical values as in our thanksgiving because when we give our thanks, we normally are thanking God for the visible, for the physical, for the material. I think the same thing could be honestly said about our praying. When we pray for somebody, what do we normally pray for? What is the burden of that petition? When you prayed for yourself this morning, what was the burden of that petition? Again, I think many times we betray our carnality and our ties to this world by the things we pray for. But if you study the prayers of the apostle recorded here in Philippians and one in Colossians and two in Ephesians, and then there are snatches of recorded prayer in the other letters, you'll find that Paul never, uh, with maybe just a one or two rare exception, prays for the things that you and I might pray for. Even in this letter, he's not praying for their physical well-being. He's not praying that God would increase their paycheck. He's not praying for a myriad of things that we might choose to pray for. And yet, Paul singles out one thing to pray for. And this, is, this, this prayer is one of Paul's most outstanding. And it's really a single petition. Basically, he asks for only one thing. But that prayer is like a telescope. And that basic petition lengthens out in its consequences and in its results. He prays for this in order that they might do this, in order that this might be so, and ultimately in order that this might be accomplished. And so it is like, as I said, a telescope, and it continues to lengthen, but it is a single petition. Now what is that single petition that God makes? And remember, when Paul is praying for this, expressing his own desire, he is also expressing the desire of God. And Paul felt that this was the one thing needful in the lives of these Philippians. Here it is. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, so that you may approve things that are excellent, in order that you may be sincere. Now, Paul prays. I ask this, he says of the Lord, that your love may abound. Of all the things in the catalog of God's riches that Paul could secure for them through prayer, he selects love, indicating that the great need in the lives of these believers, as in our own lives, is that our love may abound more and more. It is a prayer of love, or a prayer for love. Now, I want us to look at this passage, and, and this prayer is so great, and every word really must be closely examined if it is to yield all the riches that are contained in it. First of all, Paul prays that we might have an increasing love. This love for which he prays is an increasing love. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in all knowledge and in all judgment. 
Now, these Philippians were already people of love. God is not praying, uh, Paul is not praying that God would give them love. Paul is not petitioning love for them. They already have love, and that love is being expressed. But his prayer is that this love might be an increasing love, that it might continue to grow. Now, one of the interesting things as you study Paul's letter of prayers is that there is never any satisfying of grace. We're never to be satisfied with where we are. You see, these people at Philippi were probably the most loving that Paul had ever known. One scholar calls it the tenderest letter that Paul ever wrote. Another has called it a pastor's love letter to his people. And there was, a, there was an obvious love in the fellowship of these believers. But Paul is saying this. There are links of that love that you have not gone to. There are depths of that love that you have not yet plumbed. There is far more in this matter of love than you have yet experienced. Love can always increase, you see. No one has ever, ever yet loved to the limit of possibility. No, no, matter, no matter how much no matter how much you've given, no matter how much you've loved, friend, you have not yet loved to the limit. So this is to be, Paul prays, an increasing love. Now, I want us to notice two things about this love. First of all, it is an expensive love. It is an expensive love. I don't think I need to labor the point that the Greek word translated love here is the word agape. And that is the most frequent word used in the New Testament to describe love. And as you have heard many times, I'm certain this is called divine love. It is the word that is used of God when describing his love towards us. Now, this is not a sentimental love. It's not a sensual love in the true sense of the word. But rather, it is a sacrificing love. Agape love is is the love that seeks the welfare, the highest good of the object of its love and is willing to give itself to the limit in order that that welfare and that highest good may be obtained. And of course, the greatest illustration of agape love is the cross. For God so loved, the same word, for God so loved the world, for God so sought and desired the highest good for the world that he did what? That he gave his only begotten son. This is an expensive love. And the same love that characterized God is to characterize the believers. Our love is to be self-sacrificing. We are to have at our heart the welfare, the highest good, the greatest benefit for the people. And whatever it takes to obtain that welfare, we are to do it. It is a self-sacrificing love. It is an expensive love. It is a love that does not count the cost. And oh, how this condemns us. How this causes us to uh, shrink away in embarrassment and humiliation when we look at somebody and we're going to do something for them and we're going to love them and we're going to try to help them. We nearly always count the cost. What, what's this going to entail? How is this going to affect me? And, and I've done so much, I, I can do no more. But this kind of love never counts the cost of it. It gives and gives and gives. And Paul says, when you think you've given all that you can give, I pray that your love may abound more and more. It is an expensive love. It costs the lover his life. It costs God his son. It is a love that in its very nature demands sacrifice. But it is also an extravagant love. Paul says, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. Piling up those words to indicate the extravagance of this love. There is no danger of excess. There's no danger of loving too much, he says. The word translated abound is a, is a rich word. It means to exceed the ordinary, the necessary. It means to overflow with some left over. 
You see, love is always to be extravagant. No uh, meager, shrunken thing, but it's to be a tidal wave. And as one man has said, Paul is asking that, that, that love may flow from the lives of these Philippians like wave after wave after wave, a tidal wave of love. And this word, as I've already indicated, carries the idea of having some left over. You know, I like that, having some left over. Regardless of the sacrifice, regardless of the outflow, there's always some left. You never run out. You never say, well, I, 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 I've loved all I can. There's no more left. Paul says this love is to be extravagant. Jesus Christ uh, gave us a great benediction on this kind of love when as he was eating in this house, this woman of ill repute came and she had an alabaster box filled with precious ointment and she broke the box and washed his feet with this ointment and then dried his feet with a towel of her own hair. And you know that there was criticism. Why this waste made? Why this waste? And yet Jesus pronounced a tremendous benediction upon her. The extravagance of it. The extravagance. Somebody said, well, you could have taken this and sold it and given it to the poor and you could have fed some hungry people with this. This is extravagant. Extravagant and love always is. Paul praying that this may be an increasing love. Friend, is your love growing day by day? Is your capacity to sacrifice for others greater than it was yesterday, the day before, a year ago? Do you, do you dole out your love in meager little allowances? Are you a Scrooge? when it comes to this matter of giving love to others. It's expensive. It costs you everything you are. It is extravagant. It flows and flows and flows like an artesian well that has no limit in it. This I pray that your love may abound, just overflow more and more, so much so that regardless to the extent of which you love, there's always some left. So this love for which Paul prays is in the first place and increasing love. Secondly, he prays that this may be an intelligent love. Now, when we come to this matter, we come to one of the most significant and important aspects of what Paul is speaking about. Look at the direction in which their love is to grow. And this I pray, he says in verse 9, that your love may abound yet more and more. Now, he doesn't put a period there. There are a lot of folks today that say, well, the only thing that matters is just love. Just love more and more and more and more and more. But notice what Paul says. He, he says there is a specific direction in which this love is to increase so that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. This is to be an intelligent love. Love is to be accompanied with light. And as I, as I said, today we're living in an atmosphere where love is exalted to the throne to be worshipped, where people say, well, love is the answer to everything. Just love, that's all. Just love, that's the answer, that's the key. What this world needs more of is love. Well, yes, this world does need more of love, but it is not to be an indiscriminate love. This love is to have boundaries. Now, by this I do not mean, and neither does Paul mean, that there are certain people we're not to love. Not, that's not what he means at all. But this love is to be intelligent. While love is to be always flowing, yet it's not to be a flood, not a raging flood. Water is a beautiful thing and a nourishing thing and a refreshing thing. But when it flows indiscriminately, when it becomes a raging torrent, it becomes highly dangerous. Paul says that we are to grow in our love in all knowledge and discrimination. And there he adds a very important qualification. Love is to grow within the bounds of good sense and discretion. There should be sense in love. L love should not be a blind impulse. For instance, you have an automobile, 
and under the hood of that automobile there's a powerful engine. Now, it would be ridiculous for you to say, the only thing that counts is to get the car running. Just get the car running. That's the only thing that counts. No, sir. Uh, you'd better have a steering wheel. Why? Well, you need to direct that go that, that power. You need to steer that power because that power without any kind of direction, without any kind of boundary can become a very dangerous thing. And Paul is saying love is to increase more and more up the horsepower of the, your love. Increase the horsepower of your love. But as you do so, don't take your hands off the steering wheel. Tighten your hands on that steering wheel because the faster an automobile goes, the more carefully you must hold on to the steering wheel. And the greater your love increases, the more you must increase in intelligent love. Love is supposed to be judicious. That's what he's saying. A person who has love but lacks the qualities that Paul refers to uh, may have a lot of eagerness and enthusiasm, but it may be in the wrong direction. Uh, an illustration simple comes to mind. A man may just have love without intelligence, and he may find himself donating money to a bad cause just because he loves. He might meet uh, one of these uh, young people in the airport who are all the time uh, hawking their uh, wares of heresy and uh, others who are stopping cars at red lights and saying, won't you please help the children do such and such? And this person may just feel he has so much love that he digs into his pocket and he gives money to a cause that basically is opposed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He can even be deceived, you see. It's like loving animals, therefore petting a rattlesnake. Well, I think you're supposed to love animals, but folks, I'm not about to pet a rattlesnake unless that fellow's been defanged, and even then I don't really care to pet him. I don't have any use for them. You see, you may love animals, and you may love nature, but you must love it intelligently. And this is what Paul is praying for. Now, let's look at these, at these qualities. Paul says, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. And the direction in which I want your love to grow is, first of all, that your love may grow in spiritual apprehension of the truth. Spiritual apprehension of the truth. That your love may abound in knowledge. Now, this is a very strong word, translated knowledge. It indicates full knowledge. And it always has the idea of knowledge that is born of experience. It is a mental grasp of spiritual truth firmly held. I, it, it's so interesting to realize that this is where Paul starts because I hear a lot of people say, oh, listen, uh, we're fed up with theology, and we don't want to hear doctrine, this old musty doctrine. We're not concerned about your creed. We just want to know, do you love us? And we ought not to be talking and worrying and, and being uh, picky about theology and doctrine. The thing is just love. That's the thing, just love. Well, that's the statement of a very foolish and ignorant and deceived person. Paul says, I want your love to grow, and I want it to grow in the direction of full and complete knowledge of God. I want you to have a firm hold, a firm grasp upon spiritual truth, a spiritual apprehension of the truth, because love without light is dangerous, just like a raging river that has no bounds. It becomes a dangerous and deadly flood. Our love is to grow, first of all, in the area of spiritual apprehension of the truth. Secondly, our love is to grow in spiritual appreciation of the truth. Spiritual appreciation. That your love, he says, may yet abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Now, the word judgment is translated discernment or insight. But this is a terrifically interesting word. We get our word aesthetic from this Greek word, aesthetic. 
And in classical Greek, it was used to denote the senses, the physical senses, such as hearing and feeling and taste. It, it has the idea of insight, of perception, of moral understanding and appreciation. Let me illustrate it like this. All of us have certain aesthetic senses, the sense of smell, the sense of sight, the sense of taste. Now, when I see a beautiful painting and the color blend together beautifully and it's the composition as, is as it ought to be, it, it, well, it's just a beautiful painting. There is something about me. I have an aesthetic sense that appreciates the beauty of that, appreciates the value of it. But over here is some canvas that has just had paint thrown on it indiscriminately. Uh, they may call it modern art. Uh, but let's say the colors are horrid and, and badly mixed. Let's say the composition is uh, unbalanced. Well, it just uh, it offends my sense. It offends my aesthetic senses. I do not appreciate it. Same thing with music. I may attend a concert and hear, the, hear a beautiful symphony played. And there is something in a um, person, an aesthetic sense that appreciates the beauty, the harmony of the music. But if half the orchestra is out of key and half of them are playing at the offbeat, then it jars, it jars my aesthetic sense of hearing. I don't appreciate that. You see, we have the ability to appreciate things in the physical realm. We appreciate good food. We appreciate the odor, aroma of, of a fine perfume. We appreciate the things that are aesthetically beautiful. Now, he says, in the spiritual realm, I want you to have an aesthetic sense. I want you to come to the place where you can appreciate things. Discernment, discernment uh, has the idea of uh, taste and feeling for that which is spiritually beautiful, you see. It's the aesthetic sense in the sphere of Christian truth and Christian duty and Christian living. Sometimes this word has been translated as tactfulness or spiritual insight, but it simply means that you have the spiritual ability to appreciate the things that are true, the things that are worthy, the things that ought to be loved. In other words, your love is going to be directed towards those things that you discern are worthy of that love. The one painting that is beautiful, I will hang on the wall. Another painting that is grotesque and horrid, I'll throw away. Why? Well, I have discernment. I was sitting, sitting in a restaurant some time ago with some friends, and we ordered some chocolate pudding. And I dipped my spoon into that chocolate pudding and took a mouthful of it. And folks, I want you to know, my aesthetic sense of taste was jarred because that pudding was spoiled. Oh, it was rank. Ugh, it was grotesque. Now. I had enough sense not to eat any more of it, not to taste any more of it, but I had sense enough, discernment enough to order some more and make certain it was fresh and to eat that which was good and unspoiled. That's the idea that Paul is speaking of here. First of all, our love is to grow intelligently in the area of spiritual apprehension of the truth, secondly, spiritual appreciation of the truth, and thirdly, spiritual approbation of the truth or approval of the truth. Now, see how Paul is building up. He says in verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge, and in all judgment, why? Why? Why do we need this judgment? Why do we need this discernment in our love? So, he says, that you may approve things that are excellent. Spiritual approbation of the truth. 
that you may approve things that are excellent. Now, we need to look at these two words before we can understand clearly what the apostle is saying. The word approve means to put to the test to examine something for the purpose of approving it. It was used of testing metals to find out which was genuine and which was not. So that we may be able to prove, put things to the test, examine them, and approve that which is excellent. Now, the word excellent means worth more than something else. It means to be superior or to surpass in worth. All right, now let's put it together. Paul is saying, I am praying that your love may abound more and more in spiritual knowledge, apprehension of truth, and appreciation of that which is true so that you can, by comparison and examination, learn what things uh, are and where they differ and which one is superior and then approve it that you may have the capacity to take one or more things and examine both of them and put your finger on one and say this is vital this is the best this excels the other Moffat uh, translates it like this so that you might have a sense of what is vital and I think that's a very good translation in other words the good can become the enemy of the best the believer isn't to be satisfied with what is good enough for others but rather he is to put the emphasis in the right place now let's put it all together again he's talking about love love is what love is sacrificing yourself going to all expense and, stra and extravagant Love is giving of yourself without thought of repayment. Now, he says this, that sacrificing love must be directed towards things that are worthy of that sacrifice. And one of the greatest follies among Christians today is that we're devoting ourselves to things that are inferior. I challenge you to examine practically any church and to see where our energies are are being diverted and see where we're putting the emphasis many many times we are giving ourselves and giving the emphasis to things that are not excellent and the great tragedy is too many of us don't have sense enough to know better illustrations we hear a great deal about uh, healing and I believe that God heals when it pleases him to heal but I've seen some who have gone so far that they are placing more emphasis on physical healing than they are spiritual salvation. Now, folks, that reveals a lack of spiritual discernment. Both of them are good and wonderful, and, and we're thrilled when somebody is physically healed, healed. But if we lack spiritual discernment, we will put the emphasis all on the physical and not on the spiritual. We've almost gotten to the place sometimes where we talk so much about God supplying our needs that we become obsessed with material blessings from God. And I, I, I know some people who will evaluate your spirituality by how much God blesses you materially. Well, now that betrays a lack of spiritual discernment. When I was in seminary, in missions class, and we were talking about sending the gospel to those who've never heard. Inevitably, we'd have somebody in that class who would stand up and say, well, what we ought to do is go over there and feed those people and educate those people and help them to get themselves on their feet. Now, that sounds wonderful. That sounds so humanitarian. That just sounds, well, that's just so much love. I love these people so much. I love these people so much. What I really want to do, I don't, I, I, I don't want to uh, quibble about doctrine and and what they believe is their business. I want to get down there where the action is. I really want to do something for humanity. And I, I've seen people, I've seen men leave the ministry, preachers leave the ministry, and go into some other field because they want to help people. They really want to help people. And that seems so admirable. Well, you love people, but Paul says that love is to be intelligent, and you're to be able to weigh things and examine things and compare them and find out that which is most excellent and 
I stand on the Word of God to say this morning that that which is more excellent is salvation rather than healing and preaching the gospel rather than feeding the starving. I'm not saying we're to deny those. And I, oh, I hesitate to even say it because somebody's going to accuse me of not wanting to, to feed the starving children. I do, but not at the cost of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. There are some things that are more excellent. You'll find this graphically illustrated in Acts chapter 6. As the church began to grow, a large number of widows were part of that church body, and they needed taken care of. And it grew to such proportions that the disciples had no time really to stay in the, in the study on their knees before the Word of God in prayer. And they were having to neglect that. Now, I know a lot of preachers today that that wouldn't present a problem to them. They'd say, get out of your study, get off of your knees, and get out there where the people are. That's the main thing, ministering to the physical needs of those people. And yet the apostles had love, all right. They loved those people. They loved them. But they had the spiritual perception to be able to examine which is more excellent, which is more excellent meeting the physical needs of those widows or meeting the spiritual needs of those widows. Both of them are good, and we're not to neglect the physical needs. They will be taken care of. But they said, we have examined them, and we have determined that it is not right for us to leave the ministry of the Word and prayer and wait on tables. We will appoint others to do this, and we will give ourselves the prayer, and the ministry of the Word. I know a few things that the church of Jesus Christ needs more today than this one thing, the ability to see what is important and where they ought to put the emphasis. We are sacrificing and we are giving ourselves, but many times we are giving ourselves to things that are not excellent. All right. Thirdly, Finally, this is to be an indispensable love. This love is indispensable. Now, Paul says in verses 10 and 11, in order that you may approve things that are excellent. Why? In order that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God. Paul says that this increasing and intelligent love is indispensable in the life of the believer. It is indispensable to the approval of our life. He says that we may be sincere. Now here he's saying that we may live an honest life. This kind of love is indispensable to an honest life. The word sincere is a word that means unmixed or pure and carries the idea of an openness towards God. Uh, in studying this word, the, uh, the derivation is uncertain, but almost probably this word is a combination of two words, one, to judge, and the other, the son. And it probably means examined by the light of the sun. In other words, he's, uh, you hold something up to the light of the sun, and in that all-revealing light of the sun, you see that there's not a flaw there. It's pure. Sometimes artificial light can be deceptive. Have you ever put on something in the house under artificial light, and it looked right, it looked clean, looked as it ought to be, and then the moment you stepped out into the sunlight, Suddenly, examined in the light of the sun, you saw that you had on the wrong color and they didn't match and so forth. Well, that's the idea that Paul is speaking of here. And you remember 1 John tells us that we're to walk in the light as he is in the light so that we'll be conscious of the things in our lives that are wrong. We're to be transparent. That's, that's the way this word can be translated. So that you might be transparent, honest, openness that we may live an honest life. But not only that we may live an honest life, 
this love is indispensable if we're going to live a harmless life. Not only, he says in verse 10, are we to be uh, sincere, but also we're to be without offense. Without offense. In other words, there is to be nothing in us that would cause somebody to stumble. The word means blameless or undamaged, not giving anybody a cause to be offended or to stumble. A harmless life. And this kind of love, when a person loves increasingly and intelligently, when he loves intelligently and he has a firm grasp on biblical truth, and he appreciates things that are right, and he has the ability to approve the things that are best, he says, this will produce in him a life that is harmless to others. It will not cause anybody to stumble. It won't offend anybody else in the sense of causing them to fall into sin and to be lost. But this in love is also indispensable if we're going to live a holy life. In verse 11, he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Filled with the fruits of righteousness. And oh, we don't have time to go into all of this, but notice the fruit. That has the idea of it being conspicuous, of being obvious. There's something about our life. You don't have to uh, use a magnifying glass to see the righteousness. They're fruits of righteousness. They're evidences. And friend, this kind of love that is increasing and is intelligent, makes an obvious impact upon others. But notice he says we're to be filled with the fruits of righteousness, a bumper crop, a bumper crop of holiness. Our lives are to be so filled and running over with righteousness, with holiness, that there's room for nothing else. So it is an indispensable love, indispensable to the approval of our life. And finally, it is indispensable to the adoration of our Lord. In verse 11, you have the ultimate purpose of Paul's prayer. Unto the glory and praise of God. All that Paul prays for, this is the ultimate motive and goal. We are to be filled with this love increasing love, intelligent love. Why? Because such a life will lead men to praise God. It reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 5. Let your good works shine before men so that when they see them, they'll glorify your Father. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, Peter tells us that we're to be good citizens why? So that men may glorify God in the day of visitation. And Paul is saying that God's glory is to both be, uh, to be manifested in our lives and recognized by others. So that, so that when men see this kind of life, this life in which love is growing more and more, it will bring glory and honor and praise to the name of our Lord. And there is nothing on the face of the earth that so exalts the Savior and so causes the Lord Jesus to be adored as this kind of life that is filled and growing even more with love that comes from our Lord. This is what Paul prayed for. And evidently, Paul considered this to be indispensable in the lives of the believers. And it's indispensable in my life today. It's indispensable in your life. You can't live an honest life if you're not living a life of increasingly intelligent love. You can't live a harmless life. I tell you this much. If there is not that love growing more and more in your life, you're going to find yourself becoming a stumbling block to others, harming others in your life. And you can't live a holy life without this kind of love. Because in a real sense, the word holy is used of God and indicates our likeness to Him. When it says God is holy, it means that God is different. And when it says we're holy, it means we're different. And I don't know of anything that's more different today than this kind of self-sacrificing love that is both expensive and extravagant. This is something worth praying for. I wish you'd pray this for me. I'll pray it for you. This is really something worth praying for, that your love may abound yet more and more. Let's pray together.
Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you loved us. And Lord, that is an increasing love. I Wave after wave of love comes upon us. And Romans 5 tells us that even now, at this very moment, the love of God is being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which you've given us. Every day, thy compassions are new and fresh. We're thankful, Lord, that it is an intelligent love. We're thankful, Lord, that you loved us and you directed that love to a sacrifice of your Son for our sins. And, Lord, that love was indispensable. Without it, we'd all be lost and in hell today. And so, Father, we want to make Paul's prayer for the Philippians our prayer for each other. Lord, we pray that our love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment. In Jesus' name, amen.